Hello everyone, welcome to the seminar Art Museums in Mutation, Architecture Meets Museography. The seminar has been organized by the Embassy of Spain in Sweden in collaboration with the Stockholm's Architect for Rianning. As you may know, today is the first of two seminar evenings following up tomorrow at 6. Both are held here at Konstakademin in Stockholm and retransmitted in real time and also to be kept at uh, Stockholm's Association of Architects and the Spanish Embassy YouTube channels. My name is Carmen Izquierdo. I'm an architect from the School of Architecture of uh, Madrid's Politecnica and have a practice in Stockholm. I will be moderating this super interesting evening as the complexity of the theme unfolds through the presentations. I am now thrilled to present tonight's most distinguished guests. Uh, today we will be listening to five speakers, four of which are already here. Um, and uh, I will present them in the order that they are afterwards going to speak. So we start with uh, Luis Fernández Galeano. He is an architect, professor at the School of Architecture of Madrid's University Politecnica. He is editor since 1985 of the journal AV Arquitectura Viva. And between 1993 and 2006, he, ha he was in charge of the weekly architecture page of the newspaper El País. He is member of the Royal Acad Academy of Fine Arts and of the Royal Academy of Doctors. His theme for the evening will be the transformation of the museum, memory, identity, imagination. We also have with us Kiran Long, sitting on, this, on the side of uh, Luis. He is the director of ARCDES, Sweden's National Museum of Architecture and Design, located in Stockholm. He was previously the keeper of the Department of Design, Architecture and Digital at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and has been a writer, critic, teacher and curator of architecture and design for more than 20 years. He will share thoughts about the useful museum, public space and public conversation. Our third guest is Antonio Cruz Villalón, sitting on the side of Kiran. He is an architect graduating through the Madrid School of Architecture in 1971. He is a, a director of the architecture office Cruz de Ortiz. Their work, uh, you probably know, has been widely published in journals and monographs, as well as presented in exhibitions both in Europe and the United States. His many works include the Vanda Metropolitano Stadium for Atletico de Madrid, the refurbishment of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the refurbishment and extension of the Basel train station and the Santa Justa train station in Sevilla. He will speak tonight about the historic museum as a palimpsest, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And uh, on his side, we have the Dr. Karin Siden. She is, an uh, she is an associate professor in art history and museum director and director general of Prince Eugen Valdemasud de since 2012. She was previously head of research at the Swedish National Museum and is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities since 2016. She has published a number of books on art and contributed articles to a large number of exhibition catalogues and anthologies. She has also been in charge of many exhibitions focusing on late 19th and early 20th century as well as contemporary art. Karin will speak of Prince Eugens, Eugens Valdemasud de, a total artwork and an artist's home transformed into a contemporary art museum. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Susanna Peterson that will join us through Link uh, from Helsinki, where she is today. And she is the Director General of National Museum, Stockholm, and adjunct professor in museology. She has specialized on museum history, collection studies, and 19th century art. She has written extensively on these subjects and curated exhibitions such as Inspiration Iconic Works 2020 that explore the relation between the classical works and contemporary art. Susanna's theme tonight is Museums, Their Histories and Contemporary Challenges. At the end of the presentations that will follow one after the other, we will hopefully have time for questions and a shorter discussion. Uh, we have a tight schedule, so let's get started. Please, Luis, if you may, uh, begin with the transformation of the museum, memory, identity, imagination.
Maybe you can hear me better. Oh, <laughs> even too much. Uh, in, in any case, um, when we were organizing this seminar, one of the organizers, who is somewhere in the back, said, we have too many architects. And, um, and she was right. She was right, because between architecture and museography, the relationships have not always been uh, uh, friendly. You know, architects have often, you know, pursued their own interests, uh, regardless of the art uh, museums contained. As you well know, um, the architecture of museums only has two centuries, but uh, collecting art is uh, much longer. And very often was shown, as in this image here, like in this room in which we are, in which the architecture disappeared. You don't see architecture here. You only see the works of art. And in fact, if you look around, you only see the works of art. The architecture where we are is not really significant. But architects have created art, you know, buildings for exhibiting art. And they were invented two centuries ago by, let me see if this works. No, it doesn't seem to. Let me see if, if our friends. No, good, 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 good. Let me see if now. I can go back? No, I cannot go back or forward, yeah. Well, well I cross my fingers. I hope that uh, you did, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you managed to domesticate this uh, uh, piece of equipment and uh, we'll be able to and have this conversation with you about the architecture of museums. I'm going to discuss in the scarcely 25 minutes that you have given me uh, three things. First, I will give a very short history of the architecture of museums. Then I will present uh, the Spanish uh, crowd that is uh, coming here with me. And then I will take a case study because I asked them why we don't have much time, concentrate on one or two of your buildings. So I will also concentrate on one building which will be the Prado Museum. So these three parts in order. And to begin with, with the um, architecture of museums that, I, as I said, was invented by Durand the French uh, uh, treatise writer that created what has for a century and a half, all the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, has um, practically organized the architecture of museums. Some, um, an architecture of vaults with a cupola and uh, after Schinkel, you know, well, Ah. No, but, but, but that, that, that's, uh, that's... What happens with this? Sh shall, shall I try wine? I have one. Sh no. I did try it beforehand, so I, I apologize. Yeah. Okay, but le, le, perhaps you can help me. Let's try mine. Maybe uh, you put this in there. Let's see if with the Spanish equipment we are more successful. Oh, yes. This seems to obey. OK. As I said, the architecture of museums is born with this theoretical project by Durand, uh, of course, the, the, the single altars, and the, the Grand Galerie of the Louvre. You know, the Louvre was made uh, a museum by Napoleon, and the Grand Galerie has always been on the um, imaginary of architects. In fact, the Prado, which was built for something else. It was a museum of, uh, as you know, of natural history, 
also have a grand gallery, because if you don't have a grand gallery, a vaulted space, you were not a real museum. So museums need this kind of, of approach. And of course, the first building that was created as an art museum by Soan, the Dulwich Gallery in London, had the same kind of structure. A vaulted hall with skylights, top lit. So this is essentially what um, for many years would be museum architecture until the Crystal Palace. The Crystal Palace created in 1850 something completely different, a very large indifferentiated space which would influence many. But for a hundred years, nothing happens in museum architecture. So we have to jump from 850 to 950, a hundred years of no invention in, architectural, in, in, in the architecture of museums. But in 1950, in the decade of the 50s, we have two museums that change the perception of how to build a museum. Both of them, awful museums. One of them is, of course, the Guggenheim, a spiral uh, ramp, you know, in which it is difficult to exhibit anything except a sculpture, but it becomes an icon, admired by everyone. And uh, suddenly, architects decide that the architecture of museums was more than simply having a white queue or to expose things. No, museums should be memorable. Some architects think, how would you do a museum for the arts? And they say, this is an anecdote that uh, Frank Gehry told me once. When he was asked, uh, how do you do a, you know, a contemporary um, arts museum? I would subordinate myself to the works of art. But his friends, his, his artist friends said, no, no, you must produce an icon, something that people want to visit because they want to come and see my works, and they will not come to a banal, neutral building. So in that sense, architecture and museography um, conflicted, but architecture managed to provide his point of view. And the same in a, in a building that was contemporary, you know, the, the National Gallery by Mies van der Rohe in Berlin, if you have visited, you know, it's a very bad museum. Neither the large hall nor the plintum is adapted to exhibiting works of art. But in the end, it's a great work of architecture that is visited for its own value. And this creates interest in the works of art which are exhibited inside. So buildings which were not thought as being nice to the art, in the end, become the best buildings for the arts. Of course, um, when you see this, you feel dismay. You know that it is very difficult to, to um, exhibit things. And when you compare them with the two extraordinary art museums that uh, Louis Kahn built, that you probably have visited if you are architects, because uh, this one in Fort Worth, the Kimball, or the, um, the Museum of British Art in Yale, somehow Louis Kahn managed to make buildings that were icons and in which art would show with its full glory. But icons, in the end, would pull the, the day. And both the Pompidou, or by, by uh, as you know, uh, Piano and Rogers, or the Sainsbury Center by Norma Foster, in the end, they didn't work fine as museums, because the architecture here was so powerful, you know, and the, mm, the expression of technology was so overpowering that uh, you say, is it a good museum, the Pompidou? Maybe it's not a good museum, but we all go to Paris to see it. If only, you know, to go through the, you know, to the staircase to, to see the views of the roofs of Paris. So in the end, the good architecture has a way of surviving things. 
Of course, the postmodern uh, moment meant that art museums look towards the past. And be uh, James Stirling in Stuttgart or Raphael Moneo in Merida, they all mm, tried to reconnect modernity with uh, timeless architecture. And in the end, uh, became uh, wonderful pieces ar of architecture which uh, were able you know, to create excitement about architecture and about art. Renzo Piano, whom we have seen uh, in, um, in the Pompidou doing a great urban icon, produced his best museums in, uh, in Houston, you know, the Menil. The Menil Museum is probably one of the best museums ever built and is silent, is almost nothing. Something completely contradictory with with the icons that would flourish in the 80s, be it, you know, the, the uh, uh, pay pyramids in the Louvre, which is only uh, skylit for the, uh, for, for the main hall, or um, the uh, Jewish Museum by Dan Liebeskin in Berlin, or, of course, the uh, more remarkable icon of them all, and perhaps the more significant architect of the end of the 20th century, the the, the Guggenheim in Bilbao by Frank Gehry, of which I have shown with several images because I thought that um, things should be um, stressed that this building, which again, following the example of Wright and Mies van der Rohe, is not a very good uh, space for exhibiting works of art, but is such a magnificent urban sculpture that has changed the city and change our perception of art and architecture. Only um, two more um, small uh, references to buildings completed in the first 20 years of this century. Uh, one of them is, of course, the, uh, the Tate Modern, um, you know, this, this uh, power station that was remodeled by Herzog and the Muren, and which uh, by leaving empty the turbine hall has created a space where architects, sorry, where artists, you know, um, are, um, well, reach their sort of their, their um, more significant uh, success. If you are an artist, what you want to exhibit is in the turbine hall of the Tate. And it is nothing but an industrial building simply mm, bared of anything that, uh, you know, of, of the industrial parts. So here, architecture expresses itself as almost nothing and has managed to create the best space for the exhibition of art. And uh, another collection of uh, museums in Berlin the Museum Insel, that David Chipperfield remodeled, you know, many uh, probably know his work there. We were discussing David Chipperfield uh, only a few minutes ago. And, uh, and indeed, uh, like the uh, Herzog and the Muram volunteer, he was able to establish a dialogue with the past, remodeling existing buildings in such a way that um, you were familiar and at the same time surprised by what you find. Perhaps something of the sort you here in Stockholm have been able to see in another island, not the island of museums, but the Chef's Holmen, in which uh, Raphael Moneo, exactly 25 years ago, completed uh, a museum that I imagine most of you have visited, and which again plays, uh, um, I think, um, with landscape and with existing with such uh, mastery that um, we did choose his building as the <laughs> poster of this uh, small seminar. This 
short itinerary through museums, which are only sort of uh, small brush strokes for you to remember what the architecture of museums has been, is going to be completed in these uh, two evenings with uh, a group of museums by some uh, Spaniards that are here with me. The first of them is uh, uh, Antonio Cruz, which, uh, wh wh where do you sit? Oh, you sit in the second. I, I, I was looking at you and I said, well, Antonio has, uh, okay, he, he is going to, to deal as, as, as you, of course, mentioned to the Rick Museum which is the, 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 the Cruz and Ortiz have a extensive remodel. And you are going to see in which way architecture that can deal with the past and can, in a, in a, in a historical museums, you know, as a palimpsest, as we said, you know, create a new reality. And I suppose that the, mm, the museography of the Rick Museum was so involved in the renovation of the building that I'm, I'm, I'm only eager to hear what you have to tell us. Of course, uh, Juan Santa Nieto will uh, concentrate on two buildings. In this case, no, not buildings that uh, extend or remodel the existing, but new buildings. One of them for Arbo Part, the Estonian composer, which is an amazing building. Not a museum, really, but... Um, um, I, I would say a cultural building which has the same purpose of a museum, because museums today are not only concerned with um, showing works of art, but with telling stories. Telling stories, and in some cases, they have become archives. So they have uh, managed to convey something more than simply a manual of history of art, put on the, on the walls of the museums. No, museums are spaces for the, rec for the community to find itself and uh, also to mm, reconstruct its own history. But of course, um, you see that she is not uh, listening. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But I was saying that you are, not, uh, you, you are going to show two if Two buildings and not only one. Not only this, but also another building of hers, which is just completed in Hamburg, the Mont Blanc uh, Cultural Center, which is again an extraordinary uh, piece. And, uh, and as I said with Antonio, I'm, I can not wait to see what you have to tell us, because this one nobody has visited yet, because it was open only a week ago. Uh, of course, uh, Emilio Tuñón is here, and uh, I didn't speak to him about what he would choose, but I said, uh, I hope he, is, he uses Zamora, his first museum, as one of the uh, buildings that he is going to discuss. A, a wonderful building, a building that uh, 30 years later is kept uh, as the first day. And uh, of course, uh, the, his perhaps most uh, significant and popular museum in Leon, that has become a favorite place for wedding and pictures and everything, which reproduces the colors of the, uh, of the cathedral, of the stained glass of the Cathedral of Leon, and which has these uh, amazing interiors. Or this. And finally, Juan Pablo Rodriguez Frade, who I didn't speak to you either, but I suppose, will you discuss the Palace of Charles V? You, you will, okay. So, uh, the Palace of Charles V, a wonderful Machuca work, a Renaissance uh, building in Spain that he, uh, in which he, he created a museum. And of course, what is perhaps your largest work? The Archaeological Museum in Madrid, which uh, you can see here with the, uh, uh, both the sculptures and of course the, the mosaics. And after this short introduction of those who are going to follow me, I uh, will uh, still take a little bit more of your time to take a short um, discussion of the Prado Museum. That will be very short. The Prado Museum, for those of you that do not know it, was built for the Natural History Museum, but now each of the gates has the name of an artist. This is the Velázquez Gate. 
And if you were able to cross this axis, you could find the Meninas, you know, Velázquez's masterwork, which Foucault described as the representation of representation, here expressed in a in, in a photo by, by a, a great Spanish photographer, Jose Manuel Ballester. But the other axis, the other axis opens in the Puerta de Goya, and the, that was, was transversal, this is longitudinal, and if you went to walk the museum all this way, what you could find at the end was the family of Charles IV by Goya. The two say mental axis of the museum. So a museum which was not created for art now has, um, has been shaped itself by the art it contains. Of course, the Prado Museum as a building has been built in a succession of uh, extensions and remodelings in two centuries. But the collection took three centuries to, to be created. And um, simply to remind you, first it was the houseworks with Charles V, Philip II, and uh, Philip IV, who of course Charles the, the V and, uh, and Philip II of course was Titian. And uh, in this case of, by the way, now I realize that the images do not uh, show as they should. Can we put the lights slightly dimmer? Can we dim the lights? No? No? Is there a dimmer somewhere? What a pity, because I, I see, you know, this wonderful painting by Velázquez, and you kind of see, but... Uh, uh, oh, it's for the engraving. No, I, don't, I, 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 I don't want to be fastidious, so I, I apologize. I, it's simply, <laughs> I, I felt that you should see the, the, the paintings. Uh, oh, much better, much better. But, but is, 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 uh, are those lights there? The lights on top, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, uh, we, we, we should have checked the lights before. It's my fault. But those that are going to follow me will benefit from my experience. <laughs> and, uh, and you will be able to show magnificent images after mine. Anyway, of course, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, kings and queens that collected uh, paintings um, as I said, um, culminate with uh, Philip IV and Las Meninas, but of course, do not forget Charles IV and uh, his family by Goya, which is at the end of the other axis, the two axes of the Prado. And uh, the Prado, in the end, was uh, created by, uh, by the stubbornness of a woman, the second wife of uh, Ferdinand VII, who um, insisted on the finishing the, the partly built Natural History Museum and transform into a museum of art. You see her now with the plants and the building in the background. And uh, this is how the building looked uh, two centuries ago. And um, some images of uh, that were created only a year after it was uh, opened give you a sense of what was a museum of paintings then. And we shall see some images of the interior. When it was open, only 300 works were shown in just three rooms, as cluttered as this one. And of course, as you shall see, most of the building looked rather empty. This is how paintings were shown. So this is why I said, not very different from how they are shown here, using every single centimeter. And uh, look at the Grand Gallery. At the Grand Gallery for a long time was only, um, only Italian masters were present because uh, in, in, in the mid uh, uh, 19th century, the Italian school was considered to be much above the rest. Later on, you know, the Spanish school, the French school, the German school came. But from the beginning, you know, it were the Italians. Of course, uh, Titian, Rubens, Raphael, that were protagonists. 
And this is the image of the Grand Gallery of the Prado that um, we, we, at the end of the 19th century, and something that may give you an idea of how national histories and uh, how narratives develop in museums is, is, is this room. This is the center of the museum. This is just in front of the Velázquez gate that, that we saw. At the beginning, it had, as you see, a great um, a balauster, and you could see the sculptures on the lower floor. And here were the best paintings of the collection. So in some way, it was an art history, um, say, a statement. These are the, the, you know, the painters that should be imitated. Um, this remained as such. Oh, I know I'm, I'm over. Yeah, I, I, I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, you, are, you are right. You are right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish. V very. Uh, I'm going to be quicker. Eh? I have some technical problems. So I've, I've, okay. I ask for some permission to have a few more minutes. Uh, no, as I said, this is uh, there was an engraving. Uh, uh, this is uh, a picture. You see that in the right in the axis. And you don't find the Meninas, it is Rafael. And in fact, uh, Velázquez with the, you know, Las Hilanderas is right here at the left. Velázquez was not as important yet. Rafael was more important. But uh, you see, you see Rafael in the middle and you see Velázquez here. Although, you know, the Spanish school enters into dialogue with the Italian school, but things are not yet clear. Later, when the Goya gate is created because this is lower the ground, the new entrance is created. You can see how, well, the, the Prado is also in the sculpture museum, how through these images you see what the museum looked like with all the copists, you know, heavily clothed because it was very cold, uh, uh, copying in the paintings. And with the graphoscope, which was done in um, 1885, you know, the graphoscope was a, 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 um, just simply a collection of, uh, of photos put together that you could see with two rotating uh, cylinders so that you could have a rotating museum of the Grand Gallery. So this is, of course, a, a great historical document because we know not only how paintings were shown, but what were sort of the significant authors and icons that were worthy of, uh, of, of exhibition. This is how things were organized, and this is how Goya was exhibited, you know? Of course, in 1899, uh, that was the, the second centenary of, of, of the third centenary of, of Velázquez's uh, uh, birth, and the centenary of Velázquez served to change the name of the main room. It was called the Velázquez Room. Originally, it was called the Room of Isabella for Isabella II, but Isabella II had uh, lost uh, the throne, and they, they changed it to Isabel de Braganza, the original uh, creation of the museum, and finally, Velázquez. So with the centenary, all the sort of... Um, in the end, it was decided that this core of the museum was only Velázquez. And of course, this is something that uh, carries with it significant uh, um, meanings. You can see that not even then, the Meninas was in the center, but the rendición de Breda, that we also call Las Lanzas. So, museums change. This is the Grand Gallery, and this is how to imitate the Louvre, you know, and some arches were created in the middle to create two sections. And uh, only to, <laughs> to remind all of you that in the autumn there will be a seminar on the preservation of cultural property in times of war. I will remember you all what happened with the Prado in time of war. These are a few images of the Prado under the bombs in the Spanish Civil War that, as you know, was between 1936 and 1939. And there were most of the most significant works were evacuated and taken away 
to um, first to Valencia and then to Zurich. So um, this is also this museum in in uh, being transported outside. You know, of course, this I brought this because we are seeing this in Ukraine. In Ukraine now, museums are being bombarded and they have to protect cultural property. And probably many images like this. Uh, are now happening in in our in Europe in our very days, and in this case they were taken to Valencia, then to Geneva, and they returned after the end of the civil war. And now, n not to um, use more of my time, tell you simply that now the Prado has become a campus and has incorporated these three. Y you have the the main Prado. This is the the building we have discussed. This is the cloister of the Jerónimos, which Rafael Moneo has incorporated. And these were two um, pieces left from the, uh, uh, from, uh, the, the uh, royal palace uh, that uh, has been since destroyed, but which have been, been incorporated into the museum. And very quickly, I will tell you what Rafael Moneo has done, um, explaining here the succession, you see, from this one to the end, how the museum has been growing. He effectively did the last uh, chapter of this growth, incorporating the uh, cloister of the, um, of the Jerónimos and the transforming it entirely. Um, the um, Casón, which was this part of the um, uh, 17th century palace, later remodeled in the 19th century, um, is significant in this story because it housed for a short time the Guernica. The Guernica was uh, left, uh, as you know, uh, Spain uh, and the Picasso established that it would only return to Spain with democracy and uh, this happened uh, and is now in the Reina Sofia but for, uh, for many years it was, sh it was shown in, in the Casón which belonged to the Prado in this kind of urn and finally was uh, <laughs> taken out to the Reina Sofia. So works of art also trouble and by traveling change their significance, their color, and their meanings. And to finish, this is the last chapter of all. This is uh, the, the old Museum of the Army, transformed by, by uh, Norman Foster and, and uh, Carlos Rubio into a new extension of the Prado uh, with a new colonnade uh, that you can see here. The, the, the building will s s shortly start with a very large room which will be used for um, worship art uh, of uh, antique masters, but also for contemporary works. And with this, of course, we'll allow the reconstruction of the Hall of Realms, with all, which is uh, an extraordinary piece of... Uh, it's this, this 12... Uh, um, large uh, paintings of battles and the, the equestrian portraits of the, of, uh, of the kings, they are all in the Prado. It's, it's amazing. It's, uh, in, 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 in most cases, you know, the, the storms of history disperse works of art. But in this case, they are all in the Prado and they will be reconstructed in its original, in its original space. So with that and this image of uh, everyone paying homage to Las Meninas, and even with Las Meninas um, being a kind of summary of a Spanish painting in which you can recognize many of the works that the Kip Cronica incorporated there. I finish to your uh, relief, and, uh, and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Luis, uh, we, we will be uh, getting back to you really soon. But now we um, invite Kiran Long to the stand. And uh, he will be speaking of the useful museum, public space and public conversation. Yeah, yeah. Hello, I wonder, yeah, oh wow, well, I'm loud. Thank you, Luis. Um, Thank you to the ambassador and to everybody who um, has organized this wonderful opportunity, especially to meet extraordinary Spanish architects in Stockholm. It's wonderful to have you all here. We're going to enjoy learning so much from you in the coming days. It's also a great thing that we have two cultures meeting, one culture of extreme organization and another culture which, through charm, 
and, uh, and charisma ignore all the rules to take up all of the time, which is completely fine. I would much rather listen to you, Luis, than, than talk myself. I, I have uh, some short comments and a much shorter presentation than Luis. Um, the other thing, I, uh, just to reflect a little bit on the presentation was, what a lot of masters that was. What a lot of men building big buildings, um, monumental buildings for monumental collections. And I'm sure, Luis, you would agree that the, the, the truth, though, about our contemporary moment is that an earthquake has destabilized and is destabilizing precisely the systems and thinking that produce these collections and produce the institutions that house them. And the question for the next generation of, mu of museum architecture will be how to deal with that, whether to resist it through building further monumental buildings or to try to work with it. I, I somehow wish I'd um, known I would have done a slightly different talk. What but I'm a museum director. I'm the director here of uh, the National Center for Architecture and Design. And we are the National Museum of Architecture and Design. And some of you will come and visit us tomorrow to see our uh, Sigurd Leverance exhibition, of which we're very proud. A very orthodox museological project with 600 objects in it, 400 um, drawings, an art historical work of which we're proud, a, a cardinal responsibility of any museum. But I wanted to focus a little bit on another part of our work that, um, in fact, Carmen um, suggested to me and I think is interesting. It's the first time I put this together, so I'm really grateful for the invitation. Work that, that our institution does, so that at the moment the public does not really experience, but is a huge part of what ArcDes exists for, because ArcDes has a rather unique um, role to be uh, to care for a collection and display a collection, to talk about the history of Swedish architecture and design, but also to actually participate in the reality of improving architecture and design in Sweden. Um, this is quite unusual. Most countries have divided this task, one into a kind of art, histor art historical project and the other into a kind of innovation, promotion, export-oriented project, and those two institutions run in parallel with some tension in between them. It's interesting, especially in the Nordic countries, how much tension you always see it in the Venice Biennale. You know, there's the people who want to promote, and there's the people who want architecture to be free of that. Arctis has kind of both responsibilities, and we think hard about what that might mean. I wanted to start my narrative with an uh, with, uh, interesting observation also on s Swedish museums. You showed one of the buildings of which we're most proud, Rafa Maneo's Moderna Museet. But since Moderna Museet, Stockholm has built precisely no major museum buildings at all. That's a long, long time to have built no museum buildings. I've said this to the culture minister and to many others, that we really need to catch up, and that a revolution has happened in Swedish museum, in, in museum life around the world that has not happened in Sweden. And you showed, of course, Tate Modern's Turbine Hall, public spaces of this scale and ambition and popular impact have not been built in Sweden anywhere. Um, that's a kind of tragedy for us in the last 20 years in this country. Um, and, and, uh, and something that we have, which puts us behind a lot of other um, European countries. But when I think of these, I, I grew up in, L I'm a British person, of course. I'm a Swedish citizen now, but uh, I'm from Britain. And I was a journalist and critic during an amazing period of investment in cultural buildings, monumental cultural buildings in London. And I have a whole other talk I give about that. This is just three examples. The Turbine Hall, 1999, Tate Modern, now with nine and a half million visitors a year. One of the best value museum projects. If, if what you want is more people to look at art, build Tate Modern. That's what you need to do. Or the Pompidou, or precisely the buildings you showed, Luis. But there are other kinds of cultural investment that have been interesting in London. Exhibition Road is one of them. This monumental investment in Chinese granite on the ground. Um, a gigantic piece of public realm investment which links together the Science Museum, my former employer, the Victorian Albert Museum, that's my office, my old office there, um, the Natural History Museum, with this extraordinary nine million pound investment just in the ground where people wait, the place where people share, so school children don't get run over anymore <laughs> as they used to do on the Exhibition Road. And, you know, monumental projects of this character, of course, the Great Court of the British Museum, um, clearing out a whole series of buildings that were once in this courtyard, taking out the British Library in order to create more space for visitors to be in. There's very little new exhibition space here. It's a public space. It's space for gathering. Um, I think this kind of architecture has met its end. It is at its end because of things like this, because of the way that the public realm has overtaken the museum 
as a, uh, as a place of public exchange. The ambition behind these things is to create an extraordinary new urban room where we can be citizens together, and I love that ambition. But really, these places ended up being for tourists. Nothing wrong with that. Tourists are good. I like tourists. I'm one quite a lot of the time. But the real civic conversation is still happening on the streets. This is the climate, extin um, the, uh, climate protests of 2017, which um, uh, the Extinction Rebellion protests, which closed five central London bridges, one of them for two weeks, and built new structures on it, new institutions, schools, creches, farms, skateboard ramps. The museum could not accommodate this kind of um, activity. It maybe needs to in the future. So this public conversation that you know, we all hope and wish could be a part of an institutional life, you know, in a way, with there are two parallel things. There are a lot of people in the museums that Louis showed, a lot of people. But it's an economy. It's an economy that generates a need to produce the kind of programming, the kind of exhibition making that can exist in an economy of nine and a half million paying visitors. It doesn't reward niche projects. It doesn't reward innovative, radical practice. It rewards Velazquez. It rewards you know, the big ticket blockbuster exhibitions. In Sweden, we're one wonderful thing about Swedish museum life is that we are free of that. We are fully funded by the public sector, as you might imagine, those of you who don't come from here. Of course we are. 95% of my money every year comes directly from taxpayers. Um, so we get to do what we like with it, which is great. Um, and the way that we have imagined Arc Des is as a museum of design and public life. The relationship between citizenship and architecture and design in all of its scales and forms. Public Luxury was an exhibition that we made that examined the breadth of this in 2018. We tried to reuse the public space around our buildings. We opened up new entrances in Maneo's wonderful but also rather curious treatment of the Architecture Museum in his, in his uh, um, set piece on Moderna. We will experience it later to, uh, tomorrow. And we took up topics that are all about the everyday. We are long, a long way from Velazquez now. These are security infrastructure built after the terrorist attacks in the terrorist attack on Drottninggatan just here um, in 2017, which actually happened on the day I moved to Stockholm. I couldn't get a taxi. I was like, what's going on? A terrorist had hijacked a truck and driven down the main shopping street of Stockholm and killed, I think, seven people and injured many more. The, the worst terror attack on Swedish soil. Um, and so things like this appear in the urban landscape. One part of public luxury, it was a big and ambitious exhibition, but one part of it was very simply to take directly this, this part of the public conversation and produce a relationship between practicing designers and architects with that conversation. We commissioned three designers and artists to make, very pragmatically, bollards, infartshinder, as we call them in Swedish, um, of different kinds that could provide some kind of public immunity at a moment where Stockholm was under very high pressure from the security industry and from politicians who wanted to save us, wanted to make everything safe, far from the ambition that we all have for the public realm in Sweden. And you know, to cut a long story short, this is the kind of this is the way that my museum ends up not on the culture pages but on the news pages of the newspapers and participates in a national conversation about what kind of cities we want to make after such an attack. And we even build these things for real. Now these prototypes stand on, on Drottninggatan, and we are in an ongoing conversation with the traffic authorities and with the city about what should the character be of these kinds of interventions. We connect the talent with contemporary problems. And a lot of this is done in the context, which I won't go into too deeply, the context of a, um, of a policy, a national policy for architecture, form, and design, which um, Arctis is a big part of delivering. A policy with extraordinary ambitions in it, like charmingly ex ambitious, um, you could say. One of the things in it that it says, I don't think any other country would say so clearly in a, in a law, in a piece of policy that has gone through the parliament. It says that architecture is a tool to create a more equal society. We were talking before, <laughs> at uh, Louis, that architecture, now we're in a phase of architecture in many countries dominated by property developers who do not use architecture like that. The Swedish government expects architecture to be that. So how do we make this make sense? How do we, as an institution, participate in that? Well, we took this small conversation we started about security in the city, and we've made it into a fundamental part of, of our institutional um, identity. 
We now are a hub of innovation, of practice-based research, of opportunities for designers and architects to get involved in real-world problems. Um, Street Moves is a project that we have uh, funding from the National Innovation Agency to deliver, which looks at the spaces of the streets and builds cheap and fast prototypes in the streets around which we have conversations with politicians, with citizens, with business owners, with the authorities in Sweden and ask the question, what is needed to make better streets in Sweden? We do this all over, we've done this in six cities already all over Sweden, we're working on three further cities. And what that gives an opportunity for is um, talented architects to have these conversations that they're not often permitted into. And that now culminates in a project we've just been running and which Carmen is a, is a part of, um, which we call Visions in the North. Visions in the North is a collaboration initiated partly by us and the rest of the members of the Council for Sustainable Cities, um, where we have collaborated with five northern Swedish municipalities undergoing radical, fast change because of technology, because of climate. Um, they are asking questions about what their cities should even be, how they handle this growth. And they had no one to ask those questions to. What we tried to do was create a space where teams led by people like Carmen can come in and answer those questions. So just to give um, an example of one of them, the city of Kiruna, about which my institution made an exhibition two and a half years ago, is one of them. Kiruna is a city based around um, Europe's largest steel mine. The Swedes, of course, know it. This is a significant percentage of the entire Swedish economy, this steel mine. Um, and in Kiruna, to cut a long story short, we've been able to bring a team together led by a Sami artist to talk to the municipality about the reuse of a large site, which is also a part of an old, a disused, um, a disused mining area in near the center of the new Kiruna. To have a Sami artist, an indigenous artist, leading a, leading a conversation like this is unbelievably rare, even in a relatively democratic and open state like Sweden. Um, she, she made her first presentation about her project showing a plastic bag which her mother had stitched um, and repaired because plastic bags were so rare in the in, in when she where she grew up in the far north of Sweden. And what they've come up with in partnership, of course, with architects and the multidisciplinary team, here is the plastic bag. Look at this wonderful thing. This is the kind of object I would rather see in a museum than a Velasquez right now. A plastic bag repaired by thread so carefully, so beautifully. Um, it tells me more about the contemporary moment than most historical art museums do. I'm being provocative, of course. You'll come tomorrow and see an orthodox art historical project and you'll love it. I promise you will love it. But this is the other thing that we need to do. And their project talks about reusing existing buildings that are being demolished in Kiruna, moving them to a new site, creating a kind of fictional and very strange, quite low density landscape of villas and walking paths and skiing routes and so on that can become a new kind of place that belongs in this part of the city. It's a project we're really proud of, and Carmen can tell us <laughs> even more about it, perhaps, in, in the discussion. I wanted to put it on the table today, not because I think that this needs to replace anything that museums do, that wonderful, big institutional museums like the Rijksmuseum and like Tate need to do, but because museum practice is changing, and because our, our uh, museum has these two roles. Well, I think we found a way to have real agency in the public realm to promote and to feed in talent to the machinery of the Swedish state. And because we're a museum, we're able to have standards about that work. We're able to choose the best and not just anyone. We're able to make judgments about what good quality means in architecture and design. So anyway, that's sort of what I want. That's my exactly my 15 minutes. That's what I wanted to um, say. Thank you for, for listening and very much looking forward to the rest of the speakers. Thank you very much, Kiran, for your very, very nice um, discussion input uh, for the later moments of the, of the evening. And now um, we welcome uh, Antonio Cruz to the stand. And he will be speaking. Um, his title is. Good evening. Did you hear me? Yeah. It's okay. Uh, the Historic Museum as a Palimpsest, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Okay, good evening. I shall try to tell you a long history in a short period of time, 25 minutes, to tell you something about a war that takes for us, let's say, something like 13, 13 years. 
but the history be, began before that we arrived to the to the Reich Museum. The history began with the city of Amsterdam. That was a city that, in the year 1000, it was a very small, small, small city, and big to big began to grow in and to grow in, and it arrived to be in that situation exactly like this in the time where the uh, the, the the Reich Museum began to be built. But I have to tell you that the history of of the Netherlands began at the beginning of the 19th century when the Kingdom of the Netherlands was established by Napoleon Bonaparte. And that means that for that period of time, from the, this moment till the end of the, uh, the 19th century, the, the, the museum of the, uh, the art, of the, of the Netherlands art, began to move from one part to the other. It began to be in Den Haag, then to move to the Royal Palace. In the Amsterdam, they began to go another time to the to the Had and finally they make mm, two competitions. One competition to build the museum was in the 63 and then there were another in the 76 that was the competitions competition that won uh, Peter Kuipers. And uh, this, this this competition the it was with a condition that the building had to be at the same time that the space to hold the art of the Netherlands, like an affirmation of the identity of the nationality that till this moment not, was not very clear, that at the same time, the museum had to be a door to the new extension of the city to the south, that you can see in this, in this image. That's what the plan that made Peter Kuypers for the museum. You can see that the museum is at the same time that it's a, a building, it's a door. And in this door is had a, a real street that scrolls through through the through the through the building, going to the south of the of the city. You can see like like in the first moment, or not only pedestrian and others, but even the trams pass through the through the building till the point that really the passage is the property of the city of Amsterdam. It's not the property of the museum. And the problem for Kuiper, Kuiper was an architect that was trained in French, in the academy. And that, that was trained in this, this, those kind of building that uh, Luis Fernández Galeano had shown you. They, can, they, can, they get, was able to ordinate a building to place the entrance, the, the, the courtyard, and, and so on. But the problem that Kuiper had, that the center where the door and the main staircase had to be till the what the, he he can he, ha, he can they they was already occupied by one street and that's what a problem that for Kuiper was very difficult to to resolve till the point that they present two different pro, two, two different possibilities the first possibility was that that the entrance was to the courtyard and from the courtyard get to the two staircases that were placed in the front of the, of the building. At the second possibility, that was the possibility that finally would decide is to have two doors. Okay, you can understand that this, this, this drawing showed the two possibilities, and the, and the one on the right-hand side is the one that finally would decide. They had two doors, and immediately the uh, staircase, or the two staircases would place it in front of the, of the, of the doors. Like this, the courtyard uh, was used like part of the museum. You can see here the, the, the courtyard with full of different pieces like part of the, of the museum. And this is a, a, a decision that's okay, that's what's like this. But the problem, the museum had a lot of problems because in the very beginning, you can see the museum that how it was open in uh, July 70, no, 85. In, in, in 85, it was open like this. And they would say, received a lot of critics because that was the moment in which everybody began to think that a museum is a space to show the piece of art. And the museum had not to be a building 
very significant that what was important is to see the painter, to see the sculpture, and the building had to be only in the service to that fact to be to show the work of art. And the museum suffer a lot of transformation, as you can see here. Uh, now you already see in the in the draw in the photograph of the left hand side, like some picture had disappeared. A bit to bit, everything was painted in white, and at the end there was the, this. This is the front hall. This is the main room in the upper part, in the in the ground in the main ground floor, and that's what how the building the the, the the front hall was in that moment, like this or like that, occupied for different, for different use and without any of this picture. The difference, and this is important in the conversation that we had today, the difference was the concept of what, what had to be a museum. When Kuiper opened the museum at the end of the 19th century, the building itself was part of the exhibition, was part of what the, the, of the experience to go to the museum. And bit to bit, the museum had to be only a neutral container for the piece of art. And the same thing happened in the, in the Room of Honor. That's what the main uh, upper uh, room, where the main piece was to be shown. And you can see in this image how the Room of Honor, bit to be, is losing the painture, losing decoration, and at the end arriving to this very wide space. And this is how we received the Room of Honor when we arrived. You see already that the night nice work is in the, in the, at the end of the, of the Room of Honor. You can see there. And this is important in this, in this conversation. But the change that they made in the building was not only in the decoration, it was all also in the use of the courtyards. And the courtyards that were part of the main structure of the building, that were pieces that were needed to understand where you are in the interior of the museum, was full of different constructions that you can see in this building, and all the red are remodelation of the elements. You can see how the building had been treated and have been transformed. Everything in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the building was considered not to be important. For instance, this is the Korea, how they put all the elements for the air conditioning, or how they built in another Korean uh, space for uh, an auditorium, or different piece in the interior also of the, of the, of the Korea. That means that even that the building, you can feel like this, the north facets, and seem to be resistant to the pass of the time in the interior was absolutely modified, absolutely. Other modifications have been done also in the surrounding of the building. For instance, this trident that initially was, let the, was transformed for the construction and some pieces in the in the south and that means that at the end the south facade received a lot of new elements even the the the, the north facade maintained his identity the south facade was very transformed when we arrived the first thing that we decided in the competition was to recuperate the, the, the Korea to demolish all the construction and demolish and to have again the Korea back. But at the same time, there is another problem in the new museum. The other problem in the new, muse in the new museum is that there is some new function that doesn't exist in the museum that were, were built at the end of the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, uh, this museum received something like 3,000 300,000 uh, spectators, and in this moment, I think we are in three or four millions. And the museum, you remember how were, where were the doors and where were the, is the stair. From the door to the stair, there was only a small room, like from 50 square meters, something like this. 
There is nothing for the receive the visitor, nothing for the garderobe, tickets, shop, uh, cafeteria, nothing at all that exists. They were needed, all these new use. And that's what we propose to build under the level of the Korea. That was the, the sketch of the first decision to connect the two Koreas in the under the, the under the process and to make different elements, auditorium, shop, cafeteria, all this in the in the in the underground of the of the, of the courtyards. At the same time, we propose how to go to this level. This is the decision that we propose. That means to have these elements, I mean, in the past, in the middle to the past, to make a hole, in that way that you can go down for these stars and connect the two courtyards, one to the other, to in the in, 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 in lower level of the passage. That was possible because we can build under the water, that they cannot build under the water in the Kuiper's time. And that was, that's why we can do this project and not Kuiper's. Okay, uh, this is the same models without, without the, the passage to explain that. And this, this is the proposition that we did for the different elements that we have. Okay, I don't know. Okay, all these elements. This is one auditorium. This is the construction under the passage. This is the passage with a hole in the middle, the stairs, auditoriums. This is the cafeteria. This is the shop. That means all these elements that a new museum uh, needs and that they have not in the 19th century. At the end, this is the same problem that had followed all the all, all the uh, all the classical museum in Europe. They began with the with the Louvre, with the pyramid, and they after with the the British, and then with the Prado. All the big museum in Europe were transformed to receive the amount of visitors that they have. And I pay attention to this element that appeared in this level. This is another proposal for us that is going to have a lot of important in the new museum. And I also would like to see how Kuiper have uh, worked with, the, with this symmetry axis north-south because the problem of Kuiper was to link the north with the south and Arsenal and we have been working with an east-west axis of symmetry because our uh, problem was to link the east with the west. That what would we uh, accomplish with this level in the uh, lower the the passage? Okay, that's. And here we see the situation of the two uh, the two Korea and how they are unified by this lower passage. Uh, we are going to see. Uh, video in which we see how we pro the, the proposal that we had for the enter to the to the museum okay the first thing is to yeah, uh, okay sorry the thing that we propose is to demolish the wall that was in the it were in the here and there to let the the light come into the to the passage and then the proposal was to open in the middle of the passage a new level with stair that allows us to go down and to link the two, the two levels. Okay, once that we had done this entrance, we can go down and we see how we link the two passages. That's it's very surprising, I have to say that in this moment, that even though I think that that was the main idea of our proposal, and that's why we uh, won the competition, and in the end, for different reasons, that was not possible to do. But I show you how was the initial proposal, the proposal of the, of the contest that was the two 
the, the first courier where you are going to find information, the tickets, uh, all that, and that's Arch Arcade, you pass to the zone that is in the interior of the con uh, ticket control zone. And now we are going the road time out of this to appreciate the connection between both between both couriers. East courier, our oh, west courier, then we go back, we pass, we pa this is the entrance, and this is again the the second the second courier. Uh, okay, the we had many problems with this idea, and at the end we look for another for another pro uh, solution. We propose the solution with the bi bicycle going through both sides, or even this uh, other solution, which was a asymmetrical solution with the bicycle in one part and pedestrian in the other part. Nothing of that was possible. At, at the end, we had to, to go ahead with our solution with this entrance. But in any case, this is not yet a problem. This is only history. And what is important is that at the end, this is the proposal that we uh, did and in which the two couriers have been linked under the passage. And at the same time, we are proposed this element here that we call chandelier. It's something hanging from the top of the, of the, of the roof that had many different functions. For instance, acoustic function, lighting, and at the same time, the function, the main function is to give a virtual ceiling for the two couriers at the passage at the same time. There is a common high for three, the three elements in such a way that you can fill all these elements, two couriers, passage, under passage, like only one unity in which the everybody arrives. This is the this is the ground, this is at the, in the, the lower floor, and the visitor arrive, they can fill everything. And once that you are in this interior, you can enter in the museum. At the end, what we are proposing is the second proposal of Kuiper. I mean, you now you enter to the couriers, you have a love of different possibilities, and from the courier you enter to the museum. I think that this problem of how the museum, the new museum needs a lot of facilities that the museum of 19th century doesn't need it, is something important. And the other point important is the question of what is the role of a museum, of the building of a museum, excuse me, in the experience to visit a museum, where they had built with demolish. We demolished the courier here, there, and everywhere. All the all the all the and we arrived to this situation in which you fill the courier with all the damage that were caused for by the time. That was a discussion. What do we had to do? To maintain this like the history that they, like a history or to remain again and to forget this sad history. We take the second decision. And this is the, the, the moment in the construction was very complicated, very complicated. It's, it's, uh, uh, we have initially you can see in, in, in Amsterdam they say when you make a, a hole, you don't need you need a, 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 a sailor. <laughs> and this is what we had here, sailor and all this. Okay, that was really. But at the end, everything arrived to the, to the moment, and the passage was, and the courier were, em uh, were empty again, and you can visit. It was, it was very emotional to see people that had not in the past when they were child this courier open and then now they saw they can see again the courier open and that was really very very amazing in, the, in those days all the everything was with care 
the idea of this element that you can see the chandelier was here with the light when all these elements and bit to bit we arrived to the to the building to the new element you have see how we have used the same kind of the stone to do all the element that we had done in the in the Korea, this stone, white stone, that is similar to, but not the same, to the stone that Kuiper had in this socal. No, no, this is this is new. In this small socal here, which is a, a a new stone, to indicate or to let the history that what we have done, everything is clear, is done in this in this uh, stone. You can see here the the new the new courtyard is still wide without uh, without anybody there and the function of this important element the chandelier that give at the same time is this you you see in this kind of theme of museum like the Prado also they have two two levels in the upper levels there are no windows because in the upper level are for furniture and the light is uh, from the upper. And in the lower level, you have windows because these windows is for a sculpture. And that's why in all the upper part of the Korea, there, has, there is no windows and you don't need, you can fill all this with a new element. And you can, and this new element gives you the sensation and on how the light is coming from the up to down and that is something that we like to see this element that reflects you uh, or, or give you the the idea of the light going down to the lower levels all these elements that are our contributions are always in the same in the same storm and uh, okay i don't know how is the time Okay, this is going to be a little bit quicker to see different uh, points and to show you how also the this what's happened with the interior. Okay, where that was the white we began to to paint eh? and we take again back the front hall with the decoration. For instance, the, 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 the enterprise who did this floor was the same that did the floor one year, one was a century before. And that was very interesting. And the front hall, everything that was in the garden rope was new again in the walls. And all this element, everything finds its own. That means that in this moment, again, the buildings are not like they, we use, they were in the past, at only container for the pieces are. Now the buildings are part of the experience that the uh, visitor felt when they go to the museum. Now, again, it's important that now the visitor feel the history of how was the concept for a museum at the end of the 19th century. It's something that is part of the exhibition of today. And uh, everything was n in the same way that it was in the beginning. And once that we finished with that, the, the elements began to arrive. And I see this is a, also a photograph of Jose Manuel Ballester. I think this is very interesting, no? When you see all the boxes with the restored piece of art and how many art there are in the interior of these boxes. I think it's a, a very sensitive photograph. And now from that uh, situation, we arrive to that one. The pieces are again in the walls. And OK, I pass very quickly to another intervention that we had done for to, to hold the the Ashan collection that is a special collection that the museum has and we make an a special piece in the one of the Korea, the stereo Korea, with in a pool of water explaining that this is something independent of the rest of the building that they have its own well, its own space.
but because of the time, I am going to pass very quickly all this image of the, the and, and even this video, because I think we and finally the last piece arrives. This is the the night watch, and you see how in a better condition that that that, that Luis how show before he arrived the the night watch and this was places through this gate that the building have in the roof of the passage to arrive to the same place where they have been all the time. And in this moment, Betrix, very surprising, that have been waiting because uh, Queen Betrix, I, I am sure that she was waiting that we finish the war to uh, a dike, I don't know is to say in English, to, to left his position, because actually two weeks later that we opened the museum, she left. <laughs> okay, and with that image of the museum already full of people, of use, of light, of sun, and with the only piece, this is the cafe, and the, the only piece that remain in the same place, the night wash, again places in the same place that it used I finish my intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio. It was w it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, we are so, so it's a luxury to have you here to listen to this beautiful work. Thank you. And now we welcome Karin Sidem. And uh, it's a very nice transition from uh, the biggest museum, the, the big museum house to, uh, to a, a museum that has to fit in a home. And uh, you are going to be speaking of Prince uh, Eugène's Valdemasude, a total artwork and an artist's home transformed into, into a contemporary art museum. different uh, different type of museum but a rather common type of museum all around Europe and elsewhere in the world it's about the home museums and the artists home uh, and that kind of museums many of them they have been transformed into a contemporary art museum but to deal with a museum that originally was built for someone special, someone, a special person, and then to act in a museum like that uh, today, uh, it needs a lot of um, thoughts, uh, actually. And uh, as a case study, I will talk uh, especially about Prince Eugène's Valdemar Chaudet. It's located on the Royal Djurgården, not so far from the Spanish Embassy, actually. Uh, it uh, was built as a total artwork. That was a, an, an original idea, but it was also um, an artist home, originally, uh, and a home for Prince Eugène, and I will talk more about that later on. Let's see if this will work. I will try to, because this is, uh, yes, it works well. Well, uh, if one excludes uh, purely virtual museums and digital museum presentations, museums' activities historically and today relate always, of course, to specific physical spaces, which means that the role of architecture in relation to how art is displayed or understood in collection presentations or in temporary exhibitions enables and requires an investigation of the relationship between architecture, museum history, museology, museology and museum activities. A museum's architecture is often connected to the history of a museum with its original intentions and past and present visions, 
be it a newly built, renovated, or a historic museum of older dates. Different views of the museum as a phenomenon and institution, its role and function, its cultural heritage and art, and the changing social and political conditions in society over time constitute a number of important aspects to relate to in an ambition to pursue a forward-looking visionary museum work. It is not difficult to understand that my previous 20-year experience of working at the Swedish National Museum, most recently as head of research, meant completely different historical and museological conditions in dialogue with an architecture from the 1860s, rooted in a German 19th century museum tradition, then this, the art museum, Prince Eugens Valdemar Schudde, located at Royal Djurgården, built in the beginning of the 20th century. I have worked there uh, since 2012. Well, in this lecture, uh, I will see if this will work. It does not. Okay. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, <laughs> in this lecture, I, I will then focus in particular on the Art Museum Prince Eugenes Valdemar Schudde and the transformation from its original function as a home museum, an artist home, and a total artwork into a public art museum up until today's work to strengthen the identity and dialogue between the idea of the total artwork and the artist home with a visionary contemporary museum activity with presentations of both historical and contemporary art. The example and case study Prince Eugenes Valdemar Schudde can be seen in a broader context, and that is of artists' homes as such, that is, a type of museums that were once built as a home and studio for an artist, and then later functions as a public open art museum. The Artist Studio Museum Network, based at the Watts Gallery in, in England, uh, which includes Prince Eugenes Valdemar Schudde, lists uh, an impressive array of uh, European artist homes, ranging from the Rembrandt's house, Francis Bacon's home, and Auguste Rodin's home, and uh, the Salvador Dali's uh, home in Spain. And common to all these artist homes is that they were originally built around an artist's personality and function for his or her life and creative activities, and then later opened up as a public art museum. And questions that are often raised in the former artist's homes are about what should be preserved and to what extent from the artist and founder of an artist's home, and how to work forward-looking and with other art in a museum building that was once intended as someone's private home and studio. Mm -hmm. The role of architecture is, of course, in this context of utmost importance to analyze and understand and to work with in a fruitful way. I will now give a brief uh, historical background to Prince Eugenes Valdemar Schudde as a private home and an artist's home from 1905 to 1947 <coughs> and to the journey this specific museum has made since it opened to the public in the summer of 1948 and up until today. To make this possible, uh, a brief picture of the artist, art collector, and cultural personality, Prince Eugen, who was both the founder and donor of the art museum, Prince Eugen's Valdemar Schudde, is first drawn. Well, Prince Eugen, you can see him here in his studio at Valdemar Schudde. He was the fourth and youngest son of the Swedish king Oscar II and Queen Sofia of Nassau. 
Eugene was born at Rottingholm Palace on the 1st of August 1865. He was hereditary prince of Sweden and Norway and one of the most prominent landscape painters, art collectors and cultural figures of his time in Sweden. The combination of being a prince and a professional artist with exhibitions with his art arranged both nationally and internationally internationally makes him of course almost unique both as an artist and as a prince. Prince Eugen came to study privately both with Swedish artists and uh, in Paris in 1887 to 89 with famous French painters such as Léon Bonnat, Pierre Puvis de Chavannes, Alfred Roll and Henri Gervais. His strong and important commitment to the Swedish art scene meant that he served as chairman of many boards for cultural organizations and as curator for several exhibitions of national and international art, including the art department at the World Exhibition here in Stockholm in 1897. As an artist and prince, he met a large number of the cultural elite of his time, such as uh, Auguste Rodin, Claude Monet, James McNeil Whistler, and Le Corbusier. He built up one of Sweden's foremost art collections with works by Swedish, other Scandinavian, and French artists, in particular from about 1870 to 1947. The collection amounts today about 7,000 artworks and has, since the museum opened up to the public, been supplemented with a number of significant paintings and drawings. As an artist, Eugen was extremely prolific, both with landscape paintings and with monumental paintings for different official buildings in Sweden. And about 2,500 works are by his hand at Valdemarsjöde, but he is also represented at the National Museum in Stockholm, Nationalmuseet in Oslo, Statens Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen, and in many other museums in Scandinavia. And if you have the possibility to visit the Stockholm City Hall, you can see a fantastic fresco, the city by the water, made by Eugen. It's from 1916 to 19. 23. There are also monumental paintings at the Royal Swedish Opera and the Dramatic Theatre in Stockholm, for instance. And this is one of Prince Eugen's most famous paintings, uh, a symbolist painting, The Cloud from 1896, and that belongs to Valmar Schudde, and there are other versions of this painting as uh, well. Well, on June 7, 1947, Eugen wrote his will with which he decided to donate his total artwork and home, Prince Eugen's Valdemar Schude, <coughs> to the Swedish state. <coughs> the donation after the death of Eugen in the autumn of 1947, which consisted of seven hectares of park and garden, over 20 buildings, <coughs> an art collection, is still today the single largest private art donation in Sweden. <coughs> and Valdemar Schudde was created by Eugen as a total artwork in the early 20th century, when nature, park and garden, architecture and fine art interact in a totality. And this took, of course, place at a time when the idea of the total artwork was realized in different parts of Europe, for instance, at Giverny by Claude Monet, by at Barkenhof in Worpswede by Heinrich Vogeler, or by George Frederick Watts at the Watts Gallery in Limneslis outside London. Eugen had acquired the Valmarsjöde estate, which was then owned by a ship owner and merchant family named Bergman Olsson in 1899, and immediately the changes to the site began. You can see here terracings and plantings were laid out on the land, some on the site existing buildings from the 18th and 19th centuries were preserved, while other buildings were built and added. And the new buildings include the palace de designed between 1903 and 1905, 
by the famous and renowned uh, Swedish architect Ferdinand Boberg in collaboration with Eugen, uh, but also uh, when it comes to the gallery with Alfred Lichtwerk from Hamburg Kunsthalle. Well, <coughs> the palace uh, was used or the mansion uh, as a residence for Prince Eugene, for re representation and, private, and his private life, and the large studio for his work as a painter. And Ferdinand Boberg, he, uh, as you probably know, he was in the same generation as Prince Eugene, uh, and uh, many of his buildings can be seen here in Stockholm, but also elsewhere in Sweden. I can mention Rosenbad, for instance, the main post office in Stockholm, the Enko Warehouse, and the Art Museum's Teal Gallery and Prince Eugen's Valdemarsjöde in Stockholm. But, as well, uh, temporary buildings at the World Exhibition in Stockholm, 1897, and the Swedish pavilions at the World Fairs in Paris in the year 1900 and in St. Louis in 1904. Well, uh, when it comes uh, to uh, the mansion, uh, it was, of course, uh, designed in accordance both of the needs of his friend, Prince Eugene, but it was also designed after a kind of analyze of his personality. And uh, still today, uh, we can definitely see that this uh, this uh, mansion, and especially the apartment, has got a very homely uh, atmosphere uh, still preserved uh, today. Um, when it comes to uh, this part of uh, uh, the museum, you saw a short film a video, uh, it's from uh, the apartment. Uh, some parts, for instance, this is the studio of Prince Eugene, on the upper level uh, in th uh, the mansion. Uh, it was later on transformed uh, and it is today used for contemporary art exhibitions, for instance, and this is an example, it's a photo from an exhibition with a contemporary artist, Meta Isias Berlin. He, uh, it was called Night Logic, it was in 2019. Well, in a room next to the, this stu studio, um, we have today a film room that was used by Prince Eugene to prepare his own colors for the paintings. And next to that, uh, it was an attic that was in 1953 changed into an exhibition space by the Swedish architect Sven Ivar Lind. As an addition to the mansion. In 1913, the so-called gallery was built by the architect Ferdinand Boberg in collaboration with Prince Eugen and the German museum director Alfred Lichtwerk from Hamburger Kunsthalle. And the latter discussed with Boberg and Eugen, among other things, especially the need of overlight uh, for the display of the art collection. And the gallery was uh, built specifically to display art from the, the art collection of Prince Eugene and originally consisted of three rooms, one of which was in a large size with overlight from a lantern. And in the 1940s, Prince Eugene chose to add two more rooms for his growing art collection. Uh, and that, according to my opinion, uh, was a decision that opens up for extensions and a complementary exhibition space and perhaps an auditorium in the future. That would be fantastic. Well, the hanging of art in the gallery consisted mainly, as you can see, of old-fashioned dense gallery hangings with a wish to display as many works as possible from the collection. And um, today, still today, because that is um, actually uh, not a bad idea to show uh, paintings, sculptures uh, from the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in this part of the museum, the gallery wing. 
And this is uh, an example. It's from the exhibition about the artist colony at cré sur loing uh, south of Paris, with Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon artists. But there has been also exhibitions with artworks by Emil Nolde, the German expressionist, and a couple of years ago, as you can see, Juan Miró, and that was in 2017. Uh, we made this exhibition in collaboration with Fondation Juan Miró in Barcelona. Well, in accordance with Prince Eugene's will, the apartment in the palace is still preserved today in its original condition, with furniture, crafts and art from the museum's own collections in place. And in order to bring the apartment to life, regular rehangings are made of works from the collections, as well as interventions that either highlight the original function or comment on it with contemporary works of art. And in accordance with the donor's wishes in the will, all furniture and other belongings were moved from the private part of the mansion before opening for the public in 1948. And since then, artworks from the collections or temporary art exhibitions have been displayed in the former bedrooms, guest rooms, and staff rooms. And the rooms in that part of the museum vary in size, are rhythmically placed on one after the other, have wall panels and light input from windows facing the Salt Lake and the park. And the former studio is today, as we could see, used as a large exhibition space for art, ranging from contemporary visual art, textile art, photography, film, and installations. And the latter, for example, uh, there will be an exhibition with uh, Charlotte Julenhammer, the Swedish contemporary art, uh, artist, in the autumn. And I have an example from today. This is an exhibition with uh, the German-born artist Anne Wolf on display for the moment. Well, uh, this uh, is an old photo of the attic uh, that a photo from 1952, a year before it was transformed uh, into uh, a more modern exhibition space. Uh, and this is, uh, well, the more most modernist example of uh, museum architecture uh, we have at uh, our museum. Um, well, with an ambition today to relate to the existing architecture, we have to analyze continuously uh, when we are choosing the locations for different types of art and exhibitions, and we have to really have a dialogue um, held between the museum staff, the exhibiting artist, of course, and the architecture to find the very best uh, result. Uh, the idea of the total artwork which we work with continuously, of course, today, strengthens the feelings of uniqueness at Prince Eugène's Valmarsjöde. Exhibitions with historic art are today combined with contemporary art exhibitions in the purpose to create synergy effects for the audience. And the meeting between nature, the garden, architecture, and fine art are today strengthened even further with some contemporary exhibitions of art displayed both inside the museum and outdoors in the park and garden. Uh, and as, as an end, uh, it is of course for us as an uh, artist home from the beginning and the private home, uh, we always have to try to understand and to analyze uh, both the history of our museum, the personality of the donor of the museum, but we have to load th that, uh, analyze, of course, with uh, visions of uh, today. Uh, and this is an ongoing process, of course, uh, and the vision and the operational development work of recent years in accordance with the changes in society has generated several awards, such as the Swedish Museum of the Year in 2017 by the Swedish Museums Association and the Swedish International Council of Museums. Uh, and with these words, 
uh, I would like, of course, to welcome all of you to Valdemarsud. Uh, maybe you have some spare time uh, before you will leave for Spain. So thank you very much for uh, at your attendance. Thank you very much, Karin. Um, I'm a loyal visitor of your museum, <laughs> and I learn very much every time I go there. You are doing a terrific creating work, I think. And uh, with this, we welcome Susanna Peterson, hopefully from Helsinki, waiting for us with a little delay. Hello, Susanna. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Good to see you all there. Good to see you. Uh, we are uh, we are a little delayed, but we hope that this didn't this didn't uh, give you any inconvenience. Uh, we are very much uh, waiting to hear from you and your uh, theme for tonight: museums, their histories, and contemporary challenges. Please, thanks. Thank you. And I start by sharing my screen. And I hope that you are seeing now the first slide. You see that? Right. Uh, this is my topic for today, museums, their histories and contemporary challenges. And I'm going to focus on these three areas, mainly the origins of collecting founding of the museums in Europe, and then finishing with uh, some thoughts concerning museums and society. Now, uh, talking about the origins, uh, this is an important topic. Whenever I talk with my colleagues or whenever I talk with my, uh, with my students, I want to remind that in order to make clever decisions today, we really need to know where we are coming from. Uh, and that was also one of the topics uh, that we just heard in Karin Sidens' presentation. Um, yes, the origins of collecting. Now creating the base for the museums as we know them today in Western Europe. Time-wise, we are traveling back into the 16th century, where the earliest cabinets of curiosities were established, either in bigger format, as in the image uh, above, or a smaller one uh, in the form of Kunstschranz, the uh, art cabinets. And in both of these, whether in sort of in real life, uh, rooms or smaller cabinets, the ideas were the same. One wanted to show the world and it's all its wonders uh, in a condensed form. And originally one focused in three main categories, which were naturalia, artificialia and scientifica. Now referring to the items that you could find directly from nature. Artificiali was referring to man-made objects and, for instance, art belonged to this category. And the last third category was referring to um, equipment that could measure either time or distances. And the collections, the earliest collections, they were also used as, uh, as um, what's the word now, kind of a tools of power they became, they became meeting places for the upper classes in all parts of Europe and focused uh, the attendants, the visitors' interest in objects that were collected both near and far. This is an image now showcasing that how the collections were displayed quite interest interestingly, showing everything that one had in the collections, uh, covering all the possible spaces, as you see all, also the ceiling quite wonderfully with the crocodile or alligator. Um, and then the very important thing that the visitors, they really 
could embrace the collections, look at the objects from very, very uh, short distance, even take some of the items in their own hands to study them from, uh, from close distance. And, and this sort of brings us to a very important notion that already at the earliest collections, uh, collecting and researching the objects went hand in hand. Uh, all of this laid ground for institutional collecting, researching and displaying as we know these uh, three areas uh, today. And I mentioned this because every time we are talking about, let's say, a new museum institution, then we are actually revisiting the long tradition of collecting, researching and displaying. The earliest collections were also represented in numerous numerous uh, uh, images, such as this one here. I chose uh, Franz II the Franken's um, uh, painting, a corner of a cabinet from early 1700 to you, so that you can see how um, the different categories of uh, collections were represented even in paintings. You see the seashells, you see coins, you see uh, uh, different artworks, pieces of porcelain, and most importantly, there in the background, they are men studying the collection from a close distance. So yet again, the interaction, the dialogue is important. Then some words about the founding of the museums. Now, when the collections were growing, and the upper class traveled from one collection to another in early uh, centuries in Europe, uh, there was a growing need to open some of the collections to the public. And some of that was done already at the very end of 17th century, Ashmolean Museum as an example, and some in the 18th century, but the big century for museums opening in Europe was definitely 19 century. And this slide, slide here indicates the different types of museums that start emerging from this kind of encyclopedic museum, such as British Museum, to categories such as pinacotechs and glyptotechs. Here is uh, Leo von Klenz's wonderful, wonderful uh, buildings uh, showing paintings and sculptures. Uh, art museums such as Prado, uh, art and uh, design or arts and crafts museums such as uh, South Kensington Museum, nowadays VTA in London, private uh, collectors' houses, Sir John Stone, and artists' houses such as Canova, and the presentation just, we just heard uh, of Prince Eugène's uh, Museum in Valsmarsunda combines these two last mentioned categories. And of course, many other museums as well, dedicated now to natural history and later other uh, subjects as well. But this is kind of a reminder that yes, 19th century, the big, big era of museums, uh, when they were built, but also when the display practices were uh, agreed. And now something interesting changes are taking place. The early days when the collections were behind the closed and private doors, uh, yes, that was limited access and collectors, collections were used as uh, gestures of knowledge and power. But then, as I said before, you could really get very close to the objects. This was before the uh, big era of founding the museums. When the museums were then open to the public, accessibility became the buzzword uh, according to the best ideals of enlightenment. Lots of good intentions by extending the opening hours, by uh, pricing the tickets so that uh, even the working class members could afford visit a museum location of the museums, uh, they were uh, planned carefully so that they were in different parts of the cities. Uh, but at the same time, the attitude was very top down, as I have written here on the slide. 
um, when I was reading the British British newspapers from the time, uh, there was, as an example, an article where one talked about the members, the audience as so-called empty vessels that it would be then filled with information. Uh, interesting approach that is not possible from uh, today's uh, perspective. Uh, there was even a kind of an agreement on the top destinations within Europe when now reading the uh, publications from 19th century. Dresden, Berlin, Munich, London, Paris and Madrid, they were the hotspots where the upper class wanted to travel to see the collections to see art pre presented and collections and venues. They were carefully discussed in the earliest art journals. Where can one, one can actually follow uh, what was uh, valued really high. And Dresden Art Gallery was one of the examples with this uh, Rafael Madonna presented in the image. And at the same time, when the museums were opened to the public when collections were completed, the so-called canon was formed with, uh, yes, one could say usual suspects from Michelangelo to Leonardo to Raphael, uh, to Titian, Dürer, etc. And all the collections in the Western Europe sort of echoed this canonized way of uh, representing the story of art. And this actually continued more or less to the turn of the century, where the first dramatic changes started happening. And this is related to changes within the arts. When art is changing, then the requirements uh, towards the museums are changing as well. New ways of expression uh, needed different ways to display art, old canon that I was just referring to was questioned. Artists, they were very vocal. They started requiring new uh, strategies for display. For instance, artists Alexander Rochenko and Vasily Kandinsky, they were very much for the autonomy of the arts and required that the so-called uh, museum men old art historians would make a uh, way to artists that were expected to rule the new museums. And for the museums, th this meant that they needed to learn a completely new language. That is a long story and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just, I'm sort of uh, taking a huge step to the next, let's say, era of change, which is more or less after the Second World War, when museums sort of finally start reacting uh, in a bigger scale to the uh, requirements from the field. And I'm now mostly speaking from the perspective of art museums. Uh, they start introducing new themes and ideas. They become self-reflective and critical they invite artists to work with them and take support from the multidisciplinary studies such as museology, sociology, economy, museum education starts emerging uh, to a bigger role and, and customers or visitors needs uh, get more and more uh, relevance in the discussions. And then next big, uh, step forward that takes us to the beginning of uh, this century when the strategies for the museums are much more dialogue orientated. Now, if you compare, let's say, to the ideas of enlightenment, where we spoke about an empty vessels, or even earlier, when the access to the collections was very limited only to the upper class of the society. Now the buzzwords are participation, community, outreach, museums want to be uh, available. Um, they want to be accessible from various perspectives, not just physical, 
uh, but also cultural, social, economic and, and, and psychological perspectives. There's lots of talk about being operative, not only on site or online, but now the new newest, I would say, uh, discussion concerns metaverse. And I guess that you have been talking about that already today, if not probably tomorrow. But the point here is that museums are seriously opening to the society. Nevertheless, I would like to remind one, one thing which is really important. Certain needs are still the same as before. And it's this one here, encountering the authentic and original works of art or objects. This will never uh, cease to exist because the magic happens when you see the object and start interacting with it in your mind, in your heart. The last part of my presentation today, uh, I'm going to say some words about museums and society. We have traveled far from the romantic ideal of the museum uh, where art was to be encountered in this kind of a uh, closed bubble. Now, more or less, the museums need to be run according to, to be realistic. We need to be run running the museums according to, or implementing business models, and lots of uh, lots of the stuff which is uh, written on the on the slide, um, from market analysis to the audience development and much more. Uh, we are talking a lot about museums' role in the society and value of culture, and this is impact related uh, discourse. And when I'm talking about the topic, I, I quite often use these four arenas of relevance. Now, history and knowledge we had already in the beginning when museums were opening to the public for the first time. Uh, values are in, in the core of the activities. When we're talking about value of culture, we're talking about value of humankind. We're talking about our, our identities. Experience and learning here is referring to the uh, our visitors. What happens when they encounter the wonderful collections and exhibitions that museums have to offer? And the society, yes, we are not, we are definitely not, and the museums are not working in any kind of a closed bubble longer. They are active players, in the society uh, with lots to offer. And in order to develop that part, we need cross-cutting collaboration for the benefit of the society and for the benefit of the people. This is a quite a good uh, and useful uh, diagram. Now, reminding us that uh, when museums are operating, with different actors in the society. Then we talk about the academia, we talk about different businesses, uh, society at large and government actors. And once we can place the museums on this map, we are already far. Um, well, this is a reference build just as a reminder that there are lots of going on in, in the world where museums are active uh, participants. And this sort of takes us uh, to the key questions that what we are doing or what the museums are doing, why we are doing that, how and to whom. And when we can answer all these questions, we are already really far. I'm finishing my uh, little talk today with certain questions such as uh, at the very end of the day I think this is one of the most important questions whose stories the museums tell and represent and stories is here in plural form by purpose because there's no one story not any longer 
in the 19th century, that was, let's say, the game of the day, that one, one sort of tried to tell, tell the story of art as if it, it were just one story. Now we know that we are telling multiple stories, parallel stories that need to be diverse in the uh, diverse and multi-layered. We're talking not only about buildings, but also places, places where art, design, architecture encounters happen. And they can be traditional, such as the buildings here from Brada to Guggenheim. They can be digital encounters or something that happens in metaverse. Certainly we're talking about creative ideas, the people who make things happen, because we, we, without the people, without the audience, the museums would be just very, very big uh, storages. We need courage. And certainly we need the contents, whatever it might be for the museum. Relevance in the society, but the content in the heart of the activities is uh, the thought I want to leave you with, because understanding the history is the key for any innovations, any ideas in the future. With these words, I want to thank you. I know that you have been sitting there for quite some time and I'm sending my best regards this time from Helsinki and hope that you have a very enjoyable rest of the evening and, and wonderful program to come tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susanna, for so valuable uh, insights and, and discussion points. It feels uh, as we have um, we have gotten so much uh, tonight, so many points of view, um, so many questions, really. And now we are um, past ten minutes of our time. I wonder if if um, you feel like we keep going a little bit more, or we. Uh, try and finish for today. Maybe, Luis, how do you think? Would you like to um, give some finishing words, or, or shall we um, shall continue? Tomorrow we continue. Yeah. So thank you very much for the evening, and um, uh, please. Go visit National Museum and uh, Valdemar Sud there. You won't forget. <laughs>